Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Implications of Recent Data Set for the Current and Future Management of Lung Cancer. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Luis Pas Ares uh, from the Oncology Research Center at the Hospital Universitario, 12 to October in Madrid, Spain. Uh, Dr. Zosia Piotrowska from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and Dr. David Spiegel from the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we do in all our webinars, there's a one-minute pre-meeting uh, uh, survey for you to take in the chat room. And you can, a similar one at the end of the meeting. If you take that, you'll get a lot more out of this. We do webinars all the time. On Thursday, we'll be finishing out a series uh, on gastroesophageal cancers with Dr. Pietroska's uh, uh, colleague at MGH, uh, Dr. Klempner. Uh, then on November 29th, we'll be doing a program on biliary tract cancers. A lot going on there. First-line therapy, targeted therapy. And then as we do every year, we'll be heading out to the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, We'll be doing uh, three uh, satellite meetings out there. These will also be broadcast uh, uh, online for you to check out uh, starting on Tuesday, December 5th, and then Wednesday night, and then Thursday night. And then on Friday, we'll be moving over to San Diego. We'll be doing four CME satellite programs at the annual ASH meeting. Again, all these broadcasts online starting out 7.30 in the morning, at least specific time, 10.30 uh, Eastern time. Uh, with a program on uh, lymphoma going all the way until 7.30 or 9 o'clock at night. Uh, we're also going to be reawakening re our weekend-long General Medical Oncology Summit meeting. We're partnering again with the Florida Cancer Specialist, uh, and we'll be hosting a meeting in uh, March at the uh, Married uh, in uh, Miami, where we're located here. We'll be having a whole bunch of uh, investigators come into Miami, and we hope you'll come too or join us online. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars, or if you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series, including a recent program with Dr. Gubins reviewing some papers from the ASCO meeting. But today we're going to be talking about lung cancer, not just non-small cell lung cancer, but at the end of this uh, webinar, some super exciting stuff on small cell been waiting for our new stuff on small cell. As we do with this series, I met uh, with uh, two of our faculty, uh, Dr. Pazaris and Dr. Pietrowska, to record a presentation. And we're going to show some of the slides that, from that presentation. The other presentation uh, that we recorded for this meeting was with Dr. Aaron Lisberg from the, uh, UCLA, who actually presented the second line data trial at ESMO. I was really curious to hear what he's had to say about that, and he discusses that in the presentation. We'll show you also a few slides from that as well. Of course, we will be talking about some unapproved use of agents, as is often the case when we talk about new research uh, studies. Uh, here are the papers that were reviewed in these three presentations, a lot of data. Just a reminder, this webinar, unlike all our one-hour webinars, is an extra half an hour, so we're going to go for 90 minutes here today and try to put uh, together these papers from a clinical practical perspective, particularly for the general medical oncologist and community-based practice has got to keep up with a whole lot of interesting, fascinating, and important data, but that is a huge challenge. Uh, so I think just to kind of get warmed up, faculty, I thought I'd show you, uh, speaking of general medical oncologist, an email that I received uh, about a week ago from uh, an oncologist, Dr. Eric Fox. Uh, who practices outside of Philadelphia. He's a medical oncologist. And uh, he has a 74-year-old uh, non-smoking uh, patient uh, who uh, presented to a nearby hospital with a large burden of uh, metastatic disease and not previously diagnosed. Uh, so she was uh, found on uh, initial workup to have widespread uh, disease. Actually sent to hospice, uh, very ill, uh, and the family arranged for a consultation with Dr. Fox while she was still a hospice patient. He worked her up, found a, a Exxon uh, uh, 19 deletion, uh, started on osimertinib, had a tremendous response to osimertinib. But Zosia, then she presented with shortness of breath, hypoxia, cough, new onset atrial fibrillation, 
And even though the tumor had dramatically improved, she now had bilateral pneumonitis, got IV antibiotics uh, and steroids, was thought to be a rare case of osimertinib pneumonitis. Of course, we talk a lot about pneumonitis, TDXD, et cetera. And of course, this question is what to do. Hopefully, she will recover. And maybe it's something to say about the fact that she made it to hospice without getting worked up, which is obviously not a very good uh, indication of uh, people outside of our field on how they're managing these kind of situations. Zosha, any suggestions for Dr. Fox? Yeah, really tough situation. These are the worst cases, you know, a beautiful response, but then these terrible toxicities, which are rare, but can be really serious. Um, you know, I think uh, there's really, in my mind, I think a couple of options here. And, and the first thing is to really allow her to recover. And sometimes this can take, you know, weeks to months, and you really need to make sure that the patient's respiratory status is fully recovered back to baseline, off of any oxygen, really off of steroids. In that scenario, you know, in my practice in these situations, I think that it's it's a bit of a conversation. You know, one option is to try rechallenge. I think the challenge with immune, with um, with osimertinib is that the pneumonitis is often not dose dependent. So while we sometimes will try dose reduction, I'm not sure that that, you know, really helps so much rather than just making us feel better that we've done something different. I think, you know, if you do rechallenge, you have to watch incredibly closely because in my experience, the likelihood of recurrence is extremely high. And so, you know, I think at the first hint of any respiratory um, symptoms or, you know, even with a short follow-up um, um, chest CT scan, you, you often will pick up a recurrence of pneumonitis. The alternative, which if the patient's frail and had significant pneumonitis, I might truthfully lean towards is to try a different generation of EGFR inhibitor like a first-generation um, EGFR TKI, like erlotinib or gefitinib, um, which, of course, have their own toxicity concerns with a little bit more, you know, GI and dermatologic toxicities, but the rates of pneumonitis with those are a little bit lower. So I think it depends a little bit on the severity of the case, but but in severe cases of pneumonitis, I might lean towards a different drug. That's an interesting thought. It's been a while since we talked about the first-generation TKIs. <laughs> David, uh, anything you want to add to this? Uh, would you consider lizertinib, or is that too close to osimertinib? I, you know, I don't think we know. I, I'd be a little uh, concerned that it's uh, more like OC, um, osimertinib than, than being different. Ooh. I agree with Zosha. I think the big thing is let this patient uh, kind of recover. Maybe the benefit she got will last long enough for her to recover from the symptoms. But it's a tough situation. You don't have a lot of options. But I'd be most tempted to retry OC perhaps at a lower dose, a lower schedule. I've done weird things like, you know, twice a week, three times a week and ease people back into therapy. Um, but you have to be um, kind of respectful of the, you know, the, the severe symptoms she had. And of course, it sounds like they're planning to put her in hospice. Um, it is unfortunate that they didn't think about or were able to test. Maybe they thought about it, were able, weren't able to test to uh, kind of start this earlier. Just to add to so, David's point, but, I think it's a good one, you know, to wait until she has a need for another therapy, right? You might be able to spend some time watching her and with scans before you have to reintroduce any therapy. I think, you know, one doesn't have to immediately reintroduce um, a TKI the minute she's recovered. You could wait and see if scans show some progression. Ooh. I think that's a great point. So I, I have a, a quite similar case, and there is a series of a Japanese series where some 26 patients that or something like that, that had some prior uh, pneumonitis due to osimertinib, uh, uh, they were rechallenged, but only cases that were grade one or grade two. So let's say mild cases, that seems to be a quite severe case. On those mild cases, osimertinib for most of the cases is a, is a good alternative. 80% of the patients do not have any issues at rechallenge, but having a severe case, I would tend to be more conservative and maybe go to first generation and then have uh, osimertinib for a later line, the rechallenge. That would be my choice. Yeah, I mean, this lady also was a non-smoker and she got the, this degree of uh, pneumonitis, so it re, um, was a real issue. All right, well, let's uh, get into some of the new papers that came out, lots of them many of them really having very important implications for practice. Here's kind of where we're heading. Uh, we'll be talking about non-small cell until we get to the end, which is going to be one of the best parts of this whole thing, because I think there's some really cool stuff going on in small cell right now. But let's get into uh, localized uh, non-small cell. And Luis, uh, 
you cover this in your talk. And of course, uh, at the ASCO meeting, we saw data from the ADORA trial looking at uh, adjuvant osimertinib. Uh, we saw some follow-up to that also at uh, the ESMO meeting. Um, but also, uh, Luis, we saw the ALENA trial. Uh, I think we've been looking for another adjuvant-targeted study, and we got this with electinib. So, and of course, the, the hazard rate for DSF was you know, similarly spectacular to um, the ADORA trial, with you can see there a 0.24. But I just want to kind of get your take on what all this means in terms of adjuvant targeted therapy in general. So, David, I'm going to start out with the ALK finding. Uh, I imagine this is not a huge surprise to you. Uh, how do you see it being applied in your practice? Uh, and what kinds of issues do you think are going to come up in keeping people on adjuvant electinib from a toxicity point of view? Yeah, look, I think it, it it's different than Adora, right? It's a, a two years, and in the chemo, it's 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 not chemo plus minus. It's um, it's chemo versus. So it's a different study, but the results are as dramatic to me. Um, I, I think it's you know just today a, a colleague from Florida reached out and wanted to know what he should test for for early stage lung cancer. And I said, EGFR and ALK, you know, I think these are kind of ready for prime time. I, I, you know, personally, if it was my family member or me, I would, I would act on these data. I think these are pretty solid. And obviously we have the same arguments that we had for Adora. Is OS going to be positive? Is two years enough? Um, what would be the case if you just got OC after chemo? I mean, uh, in this case, electinib after chemo. You know, we don't know those options. We just know what we have here, which is it delays the recurrence of disease, and it, it actually improves your chances of not having CNS um, kind of metastases, and I think that's enough. I think it's probably, the last thing I'll say on this is I, I, I think it's probably a mistake to say this is exactly like Adora. They're very different studies, a different you know, it's a different um, drug, it's a different mechanism, different designs, different patient populations, but the results are very dramatic. And I think it's good enough to to act on. I'll say one more thing. I'm sorry, because I found out today our colleagues, Dr. Jack West and Dr. Nate Pinnell, who like debating this on social media, I heard today published um, kind of a joint statement in an article. I got to find the journal, uh, their views on Adora. So that's kind of fun that uh, two people on uh, opposite ends have come together to publish something. Well, you know, one thing, Luis, about Adora was, you know, I, I, I before the survival data came out, and particularly when the when data was first uh, debated or presented, there were a lot of questions about whether the whether it would even be a survival benefit, let alone a survival benefit with a hazard rate around 0.5. And I just kind of wonder whether or not seeing this is going to change our view of adjuvant targeted therapy in general, Luis. And whether or not, you know, just the way the IPAS trial changed our thought about future uh, targeted therapies and how, what kind of data we would need. Are we going to need adjuvant, you know, an adjuvant RET trial, an adjuvant uh, MedExon 14 trial, Luis, uh, or is there some other path to getting this uh, done? Well, you know, I think uh, in the adjuvant setting, it's a bit different as compared to the metastatic. So... I think you need to have some data saying you how much disease are you preventing to relapse. And then, uh, ideally, if you're impacting or not in cure rate, that is very unlikely. And indeed, uh, Adaura and Alina didn't, uh, well, so far didn't show that. And then the third thing is about the impact on survival. The impact on survival is also depending on how many patients in the experimental arm are actually getting the TKI at the time of relapse, truly. So uh, I think uh, likely uh, agencies are going to ask for a, a trial like that in every single patient with, a, a, let's say, actionable genomic aberration. And uh, I think somehow it's normal to do so. That is my view. So. Zosha, any thoughts? I can tell you that ever since Adora came out, I've been doing polls of general medical oncologists saying, would you use like adjuvant RET? And usually like half of the oncologists say yes, and the investigators all say no. What's your take, uh, Zosha? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the more of these studies come out showing 
similar results, admittedly, you know, with differences in trial design and differences in populations and differences in drugs, but overall still similar results. I think the more we are going to feel comfortable, I think also acknowledging the practical fact that it's going to be really hard to do these same studies in all of these rare patient subgroups. And at some point it will become impractical. I think at this point, you know, obviously it's a discussion with patients. It's a discussion to a certain extent with insurance because these are off-label uses. And so we won't always get approval. Um, but but I think it's, it's a discussion that will be worth having. The one other point that I wanted to make about Alina, and I'm curious to see what Luis and Dave think, is this issue of, of whether the Alina trial supports the use of electinib with, you know, instead of chemotherapy. That's, a, a to me, a key difference in trial design between Adora, where patients, you know, could have adjuvant yeah. chemotherapy per the investigator's choice, and then were randomized to either adjuvant nosimertinib or not. And so it really didn't answer the question of whether we need the chemo. And, and Alina was different. These patients were randomized, like some of the older Chinese um, Chinese studies of um, of first generation EGFR TKIs as well, you know, to either chemotherapy, which is you know has a small but real survival benefit, or electinib. Personally, I'm still a little bit wary of omitting chemo for these patients, and and if I had a young, healthy, elk positive patients, I might be tempted to do both, extrapolating a little bit from both studies. But I'm just curious, you know, on that practical note, what what others think? Oh, see, I so David, oh. you know. Go ahead, Luis. Oh, sorry. Now, let's say most of these patients are pretty young, are younger than the usual lung cancer patients. So they are in good health. They are typically non-smokers. So I would tend to extrapolate as well. And maybe my patients are going to be recommended to have chemo and then uh, uh, the electing for two years. Even I understand this is not a trial that has been done. So let's uh, move yeah, on because really this is a, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think we otherwise we'll, we'll be here for three hours. Let, let's keep going here because uh, really I, this is just a tasting menu. If you really want to get all the details, you can go into these presentations, particularly for this next topic, perioperative immunotherapy. Again, I just want to talk like we're on rounds here. I don't want to I mean, pull out fifty slides. Uh, his Luis's talk is incredible in terms of going through all the papers. But I want to just start with you, uh, David. Can you just kind of capsulize right now how you and your center yeah. are looking at the issue of perioperative therapy? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's been a fun change. I mean, I think uh, many of us remember a time when preoperative or new adjuvant therapy kind of fell out of favor, but it's back. And so, you know, the way I describe it to patients and colleagues is you can kind of do a lot of things. You can give preoperative therapy alone with immunotherapy. You could give adjuvant um, chemo with immunotherapy, and you can do perioperative. So cycles before, cycles after. We just saw this too at um, ESMA with the trial called Keynote 671. And, you know, and you have choices of IO agents. So we have data with nivolumab and chemotherapy for three cycles before surgery. We have data with Pembro and chemotherapy alone before surgery, no adjuvant therapy. And now we have data after, and we have data after with Dervalumab and Atezo. So, you know, what's the take home? I, I think you need to use IO uh, where you can. If you if you would like giving it uh, only preoperatively and not adjuvantly, I think it it just kind of dealer's choice at this point. We don't have comparative studies to know which is best. And so for me, I tend to still stick with three cycles of chemo, nevo, and all comers. And then I like to see what happened at surgery to make decisions about whether I need any additional adjuvant therapy a change in chemo, a, a continued IO, or nothing, I, I let those results in surgery help me decide what to do next. Zosha, any comments? And what about choice of IO uh, in the new adjuvant setting in the United States? Now we have two. Yeah, we have, you know, two options. Uh, we have the Checkmate 816 regimen, you know, with nivolumab and three cycles of chemotherapy, purely a neoadjuvant approach. And now we have the perioperative approach from uh, Keynote 671, which includes four cycles of chemo plus Pembro before surgery, then surgery, then uh, a completion of a year of, of adjuvant um, pembrolizumab. So both are reasonable options. You know, we did see um, at ESMO this year that, that Keynote 671 was the first study to show a survival benefit with this approach. Um, I think that that is compelling. And certainly we've had the discussion in our tumor boards about the fact that, you know, that that does, I think, 
um, make that regimen appealing. At the same time, I totally agree with Dave that, you know, a lot depends on what happens to these patients at the time of surgery and whether or not they have a pathologic complete response. I think one thing that's been consistent across these studies is those patients who have a path CR do really well almost no matter what you do. You know, they, you may argue that those patients are the ones who don't need any additional therapy. They're going to do really well. Um, on the flip side, which, you know, the patients who don't have a path CR, which is still the majority of these patients across these studies, you know, up to 75% of them, I think the uh, the option of adding more immunotherapy, which you can also argue is the drug they just got preoperatively and, and really didn't have the optimal response to feels a little bit suboptimal. Now, at the same time, it's the only thing we have right now. And, you know, I think it, it is reasonable, but what I'd like to see is more studies in that space to try to kind of augment that therapy. So I think both are reasonable. I think, you know, well, the patients who have a path CR, I think likely are going to do well, no matter what we do. The patients who don't, I wish we had more, but still, I think, you know, 671 would dictate that we continue on with immunotherapy for those patients in the absence of a um, better approach, maybe in the hopes that more will be better. So a final comment on this from Luis. Uh, there's a question in the chat room, Luis from Hassan. Uh, would ctDNA be helpful in this scenario, for example, post-neoadjuvant to determine whether or not you need adjuvant and any other comments you have about perioperative immunotherapy? So I'm pretty sure that into the future, not now, uh, ctDNA is going to help. Today is not a very sensitive uh, technology that we have, and uh, therefore it's really difficult to make decisions based on that. Uh, what is important to me today is that many patients are really good candidates for uh, uh, preoperative uh, new chemo IO new adjuvantly and importantly it's very likely that uh, immunotherapy work better before surgery as compared to after surgery so I really like to recommend people to think about and also talk to the surgeon before going into surgery even if it's a patient with a stage two resectable particularly N1 disease I mean, it, it seems to me logical that those patients with the tumor and with the lymph nodes still there are more likely to respond to uh, immunotherapy as compared to those where the tumor and the lymph nodes have been removed. So I want to talk about local events, uh, unresectable disease, including a press release that just came out. But uh, uh, Zosia Benyu in the chat room has a 78-year-old woman with stage 1B adenocarcinoma, 3.7 centimeters, ALK positive. Uh, she says the trial restricted to greater than 4 centimeters. But uh, so uh, what would you think about, again, putting reimbursement aside in this situation, Zosha? What would you think about for this patient, including your issue about chemo? Yeah, so I think you know, extrapolating this is similar to what I would do with an EGFR positive patient in this situation. I think I'd make a decision about chemo separate from a decision about TKI. So a 3.7 centimeter tumor node negative to me probably wouldn't rise to the um, threshold of giving adjuvant chemotherapy. So I think I'd probably pass on that. I would, however, have a discussion about the TKI. And here is, I think, a situation where I would one, you know, kind of extrapolate from the EGFR space, but two, really have a discussion with the patient about, you know, what what they want to do, what they're, you know, kind of willing to tolerate in terms of the additional burden of the oral therapy, which although it's well tolerated with electinib, it does add toxicities. Um, I think this is right on the cusp, you know, of of where we would consider a TKI. And so I would offer it, but I think, you know, if a, if a patient said, I really, I, I'm good, I just want to have surgery and, and monitor and save this for recurrence, I would also feel okay with that. So, David, you know, we bring the perspective of the general medical oncologist to our work, and, and there's been a lot of work done in the adjuvant setting in breast cancer, kind of thinking through this, patient, uh, getting patient input, et cetera, because adjuvant therapy is breast has been out there a long time ago and maybe trying to put some of the difficult decisions in their hands. But for, for therapies that have uh, low toxicity, and I would consider targeted therapy in lung cancer relatively low, certainly compared to chemotherapy, maybe not that different than, say, endocrine therapy and breast cancer. I mean, not saying they're the same, but maybe in the same ballpark. But there, once they get the hazard rate, they apply it all the way down, and then they think about a risk-benefit. So if this trial yeah. didn't include this stage, they would say, okay, well, what's the risk of recurrence? You apply this <clears throat> thing to it. 
you come up with the absolute benefit and you sit with the patient and say, would you be willing to try this drug for a while to get this kind of a benefit? Do you think that is a reasonable approach in lung cancer? Yeah, I think it's very reasonable. I mean, we it's funny how we, we learn a lot from them. Even it, the, our colleagues in, who take care of patients with breast cancer, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about neoadjuvant therapy and triple negative breast cancer, where often, you know, providers change care based on the results. We're just now trying to understand how to do that in lung cancer. But I think your point about adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy or tamoxifen is very apt for this, this kind of conversation with patients. And I, I do think we're probably moving in that direction, you know, where we're, we're looking at probably more than two years and three years of these agents down the road. I mean, I think, I think patients may end up staying on these drugs for a while. If you've made it to two years and three years, you're probably going to make it to five or 10. It's hard to believe what, you know, we'd be talking about that, but that's what happened in breast cancer. Um, and I, I think you, you're correct. Breast cancer adjuvant therapy can be, um, can have its own set of, of, of challenges in terms of, uh, you know, taking a daily therapy and dealing with side effects that seem like they're not as bad as chemotherapy, but can be hard. And so too can an ALK inhibitor and an EGFR TKI, it can be manageable, but it can be bad. And so you have to learn how to manage that over an extended period of time. But I think very similar to breast cancer. Yeah, who knows? Maybe cell-free DNA will make this uh, more straightforward. And you know, they're looking at, they're excited about that in breast cancer yeah, as well. I, yeah, I do think, maybe we'll talk about that later. I do think that's going to be a strategy we're all hopeful will be a more common way to manage patients, uh, really across malignancies, but, but especially in lung cancer. So, Luis, uh, you uh, discussed this trial, the Pacific uh, 6 trial that was reported at uh, ESMO in your talk. Uh, Dervalium followed by sequential CTRT. Can you talk a little bit about what types of patients, uh, if any, were, that you use this strategy in, Luis, and what you thought about the study? So these are for patients not particularly fit, uh, so they are not good candidates for concurrent chemo radiation. So they are typically given chemo and then uh, radiation. The good thing here. In these non-randomized trials is that the outcomes of the patients, let's say, survival data are very similar to those uh, in the Pacific trial with chemo radiation and then uh, uh, development. So indeed, the uh, three-year, for example, survival is similar to the Pacific trial. So I think are very relevant data. You also commented on the issue that's been heavily debated about locally advanced non-resectable EGFR tumors and whether they should be getting dervalumab or osimertinib. Any comments on that, um, Luis? So collectively, the data we have today, I could say the data are more in favor of using, let's say, osimertinib as compared to dervalumab. I would say you see here this Pacific real uh, 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 world data uh, where patients treated with uh, 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 durbalumab after uh, radiate after uh, chemo radiation, uh, they have worse uh, PFS if they have EFR mutations. Even the survival is very much the same, likely because they do have uh, later asymmetry. There are some other data already presented at the World Lung Cancer Meeting. Somehow back in this data. So I'm not really sure about the efficacy of Durmalubab in this very setting. So uh, Zosha uh, Carlos in the chat room says that uh, he uh, encountered a thoracic surgeon who was concerned about neoadjuvant IO making surgery more difficult. Actually, Luis presented a bunch of data suggesting you get, maybe it's easier after neoadjuvant IO but um, you may have, I don't know if you've heard this from your surgeon, Zosia, but uh, what's the, what are the facts? Yeah, I think that um, it's, it, this is getting to be overall, I think, disproven as a, as a theory. And, and this is, you know, something that, that surgeons were overall, I think, concerned about, up, you know, initially, but this is not borne out 
neither in the trials nor I would say in my clinical experience. Um, of course, I'm not a, a surgeon, but when I, when we've discussed in our tumor boards, it really seems like the these cases are not significantly you know different than um, than patients who have not gotten new adjuvant therapy. So, and and as you alluded to, I think this is borne out across the studies. You know, in terms of operating room time, the risks of complications, all of those factors, which don't seem to be increased. So, I think in those cases, you know, I think the adoption of new adjuvant therapy has required tremendous collaboration between medical on- oncologists and surgeons. Um, and, th- you know, for those of us who practice at academic institutions where our surgeons are right next door and, and we share tumor boards and see patients together, you know, I think that that is something that's come easily. But I, I know that for some, you know, community centers where those surgeons are maybe not directly next door, they're visit- seen separately, I think it requires really close collaboration and communication and open lines of discussion. But it's so important for patients. So, uh, David, our uh, crack chat room has already asked about the uh, Pacific <laughs> 2 uh, press release. They're all over it. And I think this came out, was it today or yesterday? But in any event, I initially didn't quite follow it. I go look up what this trial actually was, which was kind of surprising in that it was kind of uh, giving Dervalumab with neoadjuvant uh, chemo, uh, with a uh, chemo radiation therapy. Uh, and then continue it a la Pacific versus no Dervalumab. And by doing that, you know, they were including people who wouldn't have gotten into the Pacific One trial because they either progressed or in bad shape, et cetera. Can you kind of explain what this trial means or what this trial might mean when it's actually presented? Yeah, well, so remember the original Pacific study was uh, to give chemo RT and what uh, Louise just commented on the Pacific 6, the same kind of design, to give concurrent chemo RT kind of through the, stand, the institutional standard and then give Derva, Dervalumab, and actually originally for a year in that study he just showed for, uh, you know, for 24 cycles. I think uh, this study, Pacific 2, though, if I'm not mistaken, because many of the later Pacific versions have indefinite Derva, Dervalumab. So I, I do want to clarify if it's uh, it's a little bit different than Pacific. But the, the main the main difference between Pacific and Pacific 2 is the use of IO with chemo RT. So uh, this has been something that a lot of other um, uh, disease settings have started to incorporate IO with RT. I think in practice, you know, I'm sure Luis and Zosha also, and and a lot of our uh, participants, you know, have wrestled with giving concurrent RT at times uh, for palliation or maybe with in a definitive way. But this trial was designed to prove the safety of that strategy as well as efficacy. And so, yeah, I just I think we just saw a press release that, you know, this this regimen. you know, we're going to be hearing more, I'm, I'm presuming, at ASCO, but I don't think we know. And maybe um, Luis and Zosha are involved in this, uh, where they know more. But um, we know that safety has been achieved and that, you know, we presume efficacy efficacy also has been achieved. So and although it says that it, di- it didn't um, meet its uh, endpoint, I guess, uh, this primary endpoint of regression-free survival, but Zosha, again, you were kind of explaining to me before we got started. It's kind of like this is two different populations and doesn't really have, you know, relate to what we've been doing for many years now, which is using the Pacific strategy. Can you kind of just explain that a little bit better? Yeah, Luis and I were chatting a little bit before we came on. I think a key difference about the study from the original Pacific trial is that if you recall in Pacific, you know, the patients got chemo RT and then were if they were non-progressors were then randomized to dervalumab versus um, no dervalumab and and I think there you know you're really selecting the best of the best patients and in in Pacific two you know these patients got dervalumab up front and there was no selection for the patients who really had the best possible outcome after chemo RT in the sense that you know they were well enough to continue on treatment and they didn't have progression so I think you know one potential conclusion from this is that perhaps you're you know adding immunotherapy with their initial radiation chemo RT is not going to be enough to kind of rescue those patients who are going to have the the poor outcomes and and so you know by not eliminating those patients from the study population you're washing out the benefit of the immunotherapy so uh, let's move on now and talk about uh, metastatic disease and we're going to talk about targeted therapy 
particularly things that are new. We could talk a long, long time about this topic, but we're going to focus on particularly some of the new data sets that came out. And interestingly, we're starting to see some interesting data on first-line treatment. I thought we were past that, but first-line treatment of EGFR activating mutations, uh, Zosha, a pretty interesting, uh, I, I think when you and I sat down, it took us almost an hour just to get through the EGFR stuff from uh, ESMO. But anyhow, we'll see if we can do it a little quicker here. <laughs> this is a great size slide that summarizes some of the data that was just presented, and uh, maybe we can just sort of go off of this. Can you kind of summarize some of these trials, I guess, starting out with FLORA, too? Yes. So I think that, you know, the top level summary here is that for patients with classic EGFR mutations, there's been, you know, a few different approaches to try to improve outcomes with first line osimertinib and to do better. But the way that that's been tempted is by adding things to the TKI. And one of the challenges here is that the, you know, osimertinib is a really, sets a very high bar in terms of patient quality of life and, you know, how patients feel on it. They're, you know, it's an oral regimen, it's well tolerated, it has a decent median progression-free survival. And what we learned from both Flora 2 and Mariposa is that adding something to, you know, osimertinib can improve progression-free survival, but also adds complexity and toxicity. So Flora 2 looked at the combination of carboplatin Pemetrexed chemotherapy first line um, added to osimertinib. So newly diagnosed patients, you know, were randomized to either osimertinib alone or OC plus chemo. And we saw an almost nine month improvement in progression free survival with that combination. But we also saw, as you might expect, that, you know, it adds an IV therapy to a purely oral regimen. It adds the toxicities of chemotherapy to these patients. First line treatment, which otherwise is, is a purely oral one. And I think the conclusion overall from from many of us who looked at this data was that this is great, but it may not be right for every patient. And so there may be some patients where, you know, adding chemotherapy up front is going to really improve outcomes and be worthwhile. But for many patients, keeping with osimertinib monotherapy and saving chemo for a subsequent line of therapy may be okay. Um, you, hear, you have here the slides about CNS outcomes, and I think just to highlight the the greatest magnitude of benefit in in you know looking post hoc at these patients was in the patients with baseline CNS metastases, where we saw a, a PFS hazard ratio of 0.47. I think somewhat surprisingly, we saw that the um, the the addition of chemotherapy here deepened the responses and led to more complete responses compared to osimertinib, which is a pretty CNS active drug. So in my practice, I think this will be one population where I might think particularly about adding chemotherapy first line. Again, you know, for patients where I think that they're young and, and well enough where they're, they're able to tolerate that regimen. Before you continue, I'm curious, uh, uh, Luis, uh, how you're going to think through this. Uh, Zosha brought up the issue of brain mets. What about the patient who's very symptomatic, a lot of disease, needs a response? Very much the same. So this is, I mean, looking at the sub-analysis, the CNS metastasis a group of patients is the more obvious ones. But of course, if I, I have a patient which is fit, young patient, and uh, is having very symptomatic disease, requires a fast response, high burden of disease, that would be another ca good candidate. I'm also still looking forward to have some biomarker uh, analysis that had not been shown. Let's say what happened with those that do have commutation in P53, maybe those patients are benefiting the most. Looking forward to see those type of biomarker analysis as well. David, any thoughts? I, I got to say, I was kind of surprised by the CNS thing. I don't know, maybe it could be numbers or is there any biology that would explain it? I, you know, look, I, I think we've always kind of quoted, you know, chemotherapy's effect in controlling brain metastases, maybe 20%. I've never believed that number in practice, um, but maybe, maybe you're just seeing the additive, maybe not synergistic benefit, but who knows? I mean, the numbers are small here, but there appears to be some benefit. All right, let's talk a little bit about Mariposa, Zosha. Yeah, so another combination approach. So here you're taking a TKI, and in this case, there were actually two TKI monotherapy arms. There was the osimertinib control arm, as well as a lizertinib control arm, and this was really for contribution of components. And just to say, lizertinib is Janssen's third-generation EGFR inhibitor, which we think, and, and there was, you know, um, some data that showed that really the outcomes were very similar. So I think we can consider these two drugs 
uh, comparable. And then the experimental arm here really was the combination of lizertinib with the bispecific antibody against EGFR and met amivantamab, which may sound familiar from um, patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions where we have um, amivantamab approved as monotherapy. So here, amivantamab and lizertinib together, again, improved progression-free survival, in this case by about seven months, hazard ratio was 0.70. Um, but once again, you know, I think that it adds an IV therapy. AMI is given once every two weeks, actually weekly for the first four weeks, and then once every um, two weeks thereafter. It does add, I think, quite a fair bit of toxicities and, and ones that can impact patient quality of life, including dermatologic toxicities, infusion reactions. And then 37% of these patients had um, venous thromboemboli on the combination of amulazertinib. And so actually for these patients treated with the combination, they're recommending prophylactic anticoagulation for the first four months of treatment. So to me, I think this data is compelling, although it's not, not a slam dunk. Um, Similar to what we talked about with flora, I think it would be great to see biomarkers. You know, we've seen in later line settings, patients treated with amylazertinib. There was a small data set presented at ASCO last year suggesting that MET immunohistochemistry could potentially um, be a predictor of response to this combination. And so I'm hoping that they'll do those types of analyses on these baseline samples to see if that's something that is seen in a subset of patients. And if so, maybe if that might enrich for patients particularly likely to benefit. David, any comments, any situations that you could envision where you'd like to use this strategy? Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I leaned towards a patient. You know, I think we've all had patients who say, what can I do that's more aggressive than just osimertinib? And so I, I probably lean more towards chemo plus than, you know, a laser AMI approach, just given some of the side effects. Um, now, one thing I would say, Zosh, I'm curious your thoughts. That was with IV AMI. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's a sub-key formulation that we're expecting to come into play that side effects could be quite reduced. And, you know, that could change things, but that's not how this study was was conducted. Yeah, I suspect that there'll be more data on that and, and follow-up studies. You know, I, I think that um, the biggest advantage that I'm aware of with the subcutaneous formulation is the decreased infusion reactions. And, you know, I think yeah. to me, in some Which ways- Which is a big deal. It is a big deal. But at the same time, if you think about, you know, two years of treatment, the infusion reactions yeah, happen sure. with the first infusion and then the, most patients get through it. So it is a big deal. It requires careful monitoring. It takes up more chair time. It can be really scary for patients and sometimes serious. So not to say that it's not a big deal, but if you can get those patients, even with the IV formulation through that initial infusion, you know, that that is less of a concern. But I don't know how much the sub-Q formulation will mitigate things like the dermatologic toxicities, the cumulative edema that can be seen in some patients, the VTEs. And, and so I think that'll be important to see. Yep. Can you comment so a little bit a on, uh, go ahead, Luis. Sorry, go ahead. No, so, yeah. So there is a paper actually, it's a nature paper uh, last year showing that um, looking at genomic aberrations, there is a signature that is predicting for copy, nom- copy number variations. And they are able to predict which patients with EGFR mutations uh, do develop metamplification at some point. So, you know, that should be something we should study here and look at if those patients are the ones that truly benefiting from Avivantamab to prevent resistance to happen, right? So that would be a nice thing to maybe uh, 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 try to uh, study here in this, in this data set. So, Zosha, can you uh, comment on some of the new data sets that have come out on uh, people progressing on each of our TKI for metastatic disease, usually osimertinib? Uh, we're seeing some new data here, Myraposa 2, the Herthena Lung 01 trial. Can you comment? Yes. Um, so I think um, kind of high level. So Mariposa 2 took the same combination of amivantamab and lizertinib and basically added it to chemotherapy post-osimertinib. And I think we saw p- fairly compelling data. We saw improvements in progression-free survival. We saw actually almost a doubling of response rate with both chemo amylaser and chemo amivantamab. And um, interestingly, we saw improved intracranial progression-free survival, whether amivantamab or amylaser were added to chemotherapy. And I think that, you know, that's certainly compelling. And and what it tells me is I think amivantamab, possibly amivantamab lizertinib does benefit these patients and, and they probably should 
have access to this therapy at some point in their treatment course. If they don't get it first line, perhaps in combination with chemotherapy. You know, I think the the fact that we saw similar outcomes with AMI as with AMI laser, but we but we saw more toxicities when the the four drug combination was used, tells me that probably for most patients, chemotherapy plus imivantamab will end up being where the sweet spot is if we're adding imivantamab here. So, you know, if approved, I think this is a regimen that many of us will probably reach for for our patients, you know, who progress on TKIs. Um, her patrutumab deruxtecan, I think, is another drug to really keep an eye on. This is an antibody drug conjugate, a class of drugs that you know we've we've had a lot of interest in as a as a field. Um, this is in particular is a HER3 directed antibody drug conjugate with a topo one isomerase payload. Um, and you can see the data set here: 225 patients, so I think a fairly sizable data set here. Um, all of these patients had had prior TKI and prior chemo, and the response rate was 30 percent, just a hair lower than what had been previously reported with this drug in the phase one study. PFS was 5.5 months. You know, responses seen across a diverse spectrum of resistance mechanisms, suggesting that this is a drug that we can reach for, you know, really no matter what our post dosimertinib biopsy shows. And I think really intriguingly, we saw that this drug can have CNS activity, um, relatively small number of patients. So I think we have to interpret these data with some caution, but about a third of patients with um, intracranial disease having an intracranial response. So a little bit of a paradigm shift, I think, in thinking about ADCs, historically not something we've thought of as something very soon as penetrant. But I think one of the themes that has emerged from ESMO this year is that perhaps ADCs can have CNS activity. So, you know, petrodumab can I hope will get approval as monotherapy. And, and if so, it's certainly a drug that I will reach for in my practice. So David, any thoughts yeah, about it's... these two strategies? And if they were both available to you, which one you might want to use first? Post OC. I mean, I'd, I'd lean towards an ADC then um, you know, kind of a Mariposa 2 strategy, just with all those same issues that Zosha brought up with Mariposa 1. Um, I, you know, Zosha, I was going to say, and Neil, and Neil knows more than us, of course, um, you know, did, there are some data of CNS uh, control in, in breast in breast cancer care with, uh, in her, uh, with, uh, hmm. With um, I'm going to say it wrong with uh, TDXD or two TDXD. <laughs> TDXD. There we go. TDXD. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I've I've been I've been uh, kind of surprised by that. You know that how could these molecules actually affect CNS disease? But I've seen in breasts that you know they have data. So this is this is also encouraging now in lung cancer. But it is hard to understand, isn't it? I think everything we've been told and we tell patients about the blood brain barrier, you know, <laughs> may not be true. <laughs> yeah. We'll, yeah, there mean, was we'll a talk nice about TD. No, go ahead, Zosha. I was just going to say there was a nice session at ESMO really lumping all of these um, CNS kind of uh, abstracts together. And it was a really interesting session. And I think that was one of the take homes is whether you're looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan or patrutumab deruxtecan, um, these drugs can have CNS activity. Yeah, I, I was mentioning on Thursday, we're doing our, another one of our programs on gastrointestinal, uh, G, uh, gastrointestinal tumors. In the last uh, webinar we did, we actually had a patient who had HER2 positive esophageal cancer with brain mets who yeah. had a complete response in the brain to TDXD. So, uh, of course, TDXD is being used now um, in many cancers beyond uh, breast cancer. Uh, Luis, what's your take, again, on these two options? Uh uh, and your experience uh, uh, with uh, patritumab in terms of tolerability, any uh, uh, issues there? It does have deruxacan. Do you see uh, T uh, ILD? Well, you know, I think the ILD right now, as compared to three years ago, that we were not that used to diagnose that early, to monitor that. The, this is not uh, such a big issue, particularly using the right dose, we tend to use the reduced dose um, based on this Hertina uh, trial as well. So this is not a big issue as today. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, having uh, two opportunities here, I would tend to use likely for my patients first uh, the ABC and maybe Abivantamab would be something I would use later on. So, Zosha, you also talked about the issue of uh, maybe treatable uh, mutations in these patients, and we've heard a lot about that in the past, but there was a paper uh, 
at the uh, world long uh, looking at sapotamab and people who had met overexpression. So this is not met exon 14 mutation, but overexpression. It looked like they benefited. What's your thought on this? And is this a strategy you're using, Zosha? Yeah. yeah. So this is patients with met, acquired met amplification after uh, as a me- mechanism of resistance to first line osimertinib. So just to clarify, because I think it's an important point, these are all patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer re- who received first line TKI in this case osimertinib. And we know from from series of biopsies done in these patients that up to about twenty percent or so of patients can have met amplification um, detected by either fish or NGS. Interestingly, we see this by tissue. We can also see it by liquid biopsy, although the sensitivity of CTDNA based liquid biopsies is a little bit lower for the detection of med amplification, but whichever method you see it by, this data set would tell us that these patients can respond. So here, patients got continued osomertinib and tapotinib, the oral MET inhibitor, was added. And it was, I think, a nice data set. 98 patients, the response rate to this combination in all in patients with acquired med amplification was 50%. PFS was 5.6 months. There were some intracranial responses, which is not surprising because we know tapotinib, both of these drugs are have CNS activity. Um, I think this really tells us that it's important to look for metamplification. And so really just a plug here for patients who progress on first line osimertinib to do tissue biopsies, I think remain our gold standard to look for metamplification, to look for histologic transformation. You know, this combination is not yet approved in the U.S., but we can sometimes access off-label combinations of MET inhibitors with osimertinib combined with capmatinib, tapotinib. Again, you know, that re- requires off-label approval, but there are also ongoing studies of these combinations whether with sevolitinib, the uh, the MET inhibitor from AstraZeneca, um, with tapotinib and with kepmatinib, actually some randomizing patients versus chemo. So there are treatment opportunities for these patients if you find MET amplification. So maybe we can uh, quickly uh, t- uh, hear about your case. You're a 68-year-old woman who uh, presented with uh, metastatic disease, EGFR L858R, gets uh, somertinib, good a systemic NCNS response, uh, but then she had disease progression after 14 months, although the brain MRI remained stable. What happened with this patient, Zosha? Yeah, so the, you know, I just told you that tissue biopsies are a gold standard, but unfortunately, this patient had largely progression within the pericardial space, pericardial nodularity that we were not able to biopsy. So we sent a repeat liquid biopsy. And this patient had a somewhat rare resistance uh, mechanism in the setting, in the sense that she had acquired EGFR resistance mutations, L718Q and L718V. Um, this is not something that at the time was, was clinically targetable. I think if I were treating her now, I might see if any of the fourth generation EGFR inhibitors in clinical trials would have activity against these mutations, um, although they're largely developed for C797S. But she, like many of my patients, then went on to receive chemotherapy, carboplatin, pemetrexid. Um, in this patient's case, actually, we continued the osimertinib because of her uh, disease stability in the brain. Unfortunately, you know, she then progressed after chemotherapy. And so this is a situation where I think many of these agents that we are um, we were just discussing our potential options we might think about. So, um, you know, this is a, a situation that's challenging because many of the options we'd like to use don't have approval yet. Um, I think this would be a case that would be great for patrutumab can if we had it. Um, there is also nice data to say that amivantumab lazertinib may have particular benefit in patients with EGFR-mediated uh, resistance mutations. Unfortunately for my patient, she did not have access to either of these options because the clinical trials were not available and she developed um, pretty rapid disease progression. But I think all of these options are on the table. So yeah, I want to get into, you, you, uh, go ahead. Jay. Uh, so you continue, do you continue OC and add chemo? Is that what you did there or no? We did. You know, we we do for patients like her where they have CNS disease that is controlled on osimertinib and their disease progression is systemic but not intracranial. You know, this is, I, I'd be curious to hear what both you and Louise do and, and maybe this isn't, you know, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but but it is something we consider and, and there are prospective studies looking at that combination, um, you know, at that question to try to answer this. Yeah. Actually, I had just written down that question to ask you all, David. So I'm <laughs> curious. Let me, I'll just, uh, it was just mind meld there. So, Luis, just in general, in what situation do you continue osimertinib with disease progression in the metastatic setting? 
So we only use that when you're having, let's say, uh, uh, oligoprogression. So then you do a local treatment and go on osmertinib, let's say, to irradiate or to even remove by surgery a new lesion if the rest of the disease is controlled and just go on OSI. We are not, by the label, uh, able to really uh, continue to osimertinib if the patient is having systemic progression and, let's say, add chemotherapy. That is not feasible. And truly, you know, based on the Mariposa 2 data, uh, you know, I'm not sure this is uh, a strategy I could do even if I was able to do it, to be honest, at this stage. I understand this trial was not designed for that, but I, you know, I'm not sure is uh, the data are fully are robust to go on osimertinib after progression. I, I agree with you. So, I, I can't disagree with that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, try to get through a few more targeted treatments, and then because uh, I really want to make sure we have enough time to talk about antibody drug conjugates. Uh, so exon 20 insertions, uh, Zosha, can you comment on the paper presented? Sure. I'll try to be brief with this one. So for patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions, as of today, um, you know, chemotherapy has been our standard first line therapy, and we've had amivantamab monotherapy in the U.S. approved as a post-chemo option. And the Papillon study looked at adding amivantamab to first line chemotherapy. Uh, control arm here was chemo alone, and, and we saw nice outcomes. You know, we saw an improvement in progression-free survival, I think a fairly impressive PFS hazard ratio of 0.4. Um, we saw uh, an improvement in objective response rate, 47 versus 73%. We saw maybe a hint, although the data is immature, of an overall survival benefit. I, I think that, you know, it's hard to make too much of this because it's still early days and the number at risk are quite small if you look at those later time points. But, you know, I think this is meaningful. I think all of the issues that I raised earlier about the com the challenges of adding osimer sorry, imivantamab uh, are still present. You know, we see more dermatologic toxicities. We can see cumulative edema. We see infusion-related reactions, and then here, of course, all the chemo side effects. I think the difference between, um, you know, Mariposa is that here patients are already getting chemo, so it's really just adding an, another IV therapy. So I think that, you know, if this is approved, this will likely change our practice. It may not be right for everyone. There may be patients who are older where we worry about the toxicity, but for many patients, I think this will change our standard of care. So TDXD, I feel like I talk about that every day. And incidentally, we, Luis, you were talking about the uh, Pacific um, paradigm. We, were ju we just did a program on post-GYN ESMO. There was a big uh, presentation adding IO to chemo radiation with cervical cancer that was very positive. So yeah, another tumor type taking the Pacific uh, um, model. How about HER2 mutations and TDXD, Zosha? I think the, the top line results here are that these were final results from the Destiny Lung 02 study, which really helped us to understand this question of the right dosing of TDXD for patients with HER2 mutant lung cancer. Remember, this actually was already approved in the United States, I think last year, based on the results of Destiny Lung 01. Um, but in that study, TDXD was used at a higher dose, 6.4 mg per kg, and we saw 26% rate of ILD. So in Destiny Lung 02, they randomized patients to 6.4 versus versus 5.4 milligrams per kilogram. And the bottom line is that we saw comparable uh, efficacy outcomes, but lower rates of ILD. Still, you know, we still saw ILD, 13% of patients having ILD. So it's something we still have to watch for very closely. Um, but overall, the 5.4 milligram per kilogram dose seems to be the safer one and the one that the FDA has approved and the one that we're using for her two mutant lung cancer. So anything, we talked a little bit about uh, CNS outcomes uh, with uh, TDXD, and of course we're talking about HER2 mutant disease. Uh, David, what about the use of uh, TDXD and HER2 overexpressing, which of course is where it's primarily used with breast cancer? What do we want to know about that? It seems to me, it looks like it has some activity, maybe not as much as with yeah. HER2 mutant. Yeah, it's been a little frustrating, right? Because we know the activity in, in not just breast cancer, but even uh, gastroesophageal disease uh, in, in overexpressed patients. And there are data uh, in lung cancer as well, but it has not led to an expansion of the label in lung cancer. You know, it's, it's limited to um, kind of these rare mutations uh, in HER2. But, you know, if you had it available, it gets asked all the time, should we be giving it to patients off-study? 
if you can get it, get it in high expressing patients, I think there's activity there. So I, I think it would be an option. So Zosha, can you comment on Libretto 431? I think to me, I think it may be not too surprising, but I think maybe an important study conceptually. Can you talk about what they looked at? Yes. So uh, Libretto 431 was a first-line randomized study for patients with RET fusion positive lung cancers. Um, and this is a population where, you know, we've seen a lot of progress in recent years. You know, we saw that the selective RET inhibitors, including salpercatinib, which is a drug that's used here, as well as pralcetinib, had previously, you know, been demonstrated in single-arm studies to have really impressive activity, high rates of response, high rates of intracranial activity, and overall fairly good safety programs. Profiles, and so that had actually led to accelerated approval. Um, but this was a confirmatory study comparing selpercatinib to standard of care chemotherapy, interestingly in this population, plus or minus immunotherapy um, with crossover to uh, selpercatinib in the control arm. And what we saw was not at all surprising, which is that selpercatinib clearly won this race. You know, it was um, better in terms of, of uh, you know, all efficacy endpoints. And it didn't, you know, that the safety was as expected, no surprises. Um, I think it, this really confirms the practice that I think all of us were already using, which is that if you find a RET positive patient, it makes more sense to start that patient on a selective RET inhibitor like selpercatinib or pralcetinib than it does to start them on chemo. But one interesting side note of the study was that if you looked at the control arm, the outcomes are actually very similar regardless of whether patients got chemo alone or whether they got chemo plus pembrolizumab. And I think this also reaffirms what we would have predicted, which is that these patients with rep positive disease, many of them who are never smokers, um, you know, don't benefit as much from the addition of immunotherapy to chemo. And so, you know, I think another important lesson from the study is when you're moving a patient with rep positive disease, say from a drug like selpercatinib to maybe chemotherapy in the later line setting, maybe less of a role here for, for a drug like pembrolizumab than we might in other non-small cell lung cancer subtypes. So, uh, Luis, one of the things I really liked about this study is one of the things that I've kind of been observing over the years is the issue of, you know, how much data do we need in order to take action? And we talked about it as related to adjuvant therapy. But we know a lot of our audience is fairly new to oncology and maybe doesn't know the history of targeted therapy, that there actually were, there was originally a randomized trial, I think it was called the IPAS study, chemo versus, I think it was Jafitnib or Lotnib. Uh, and, and I think there was one in ALK like that. And then there have been very few studies like this since we sort of assumed the principle would ab apply. I was going to ask you, uh, Luis, uh, if you could, or would you use a TDXD first line, or do you need a study to prove it? And any thoughts about this study here and kind of what it means in general? So, you know, I think uh, when you're having a, a, a oncogene addictive disease and you have a specific drug such as the case for non-small cell lung cancer driven by red fusions i don't think today we need a randomized trial if the data of single cohort trials shows enough magnitude of benefit as compared to historical controls the reason for randomized trials is because diseases are not homogeneous are pretty heterogeneous. So you have to be sure that patients are distributed uh, uh, in the two arms. But your disease is defined genetically, such as the case on a red driven tumor. I don't think uh, uh, randomization is that important. And indeed, you know, the result was as expected. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we shouldn't do trials in diseases like that in the metastatic setting anymore, to be honest. David, just out of curiosity, in what line therapy do you use a TDXD and HER2 mutant disease? Um, I think it's something you could use up front, but, you know, we, we didn't talk a lot about safety. I mean, there are some issues there that, uh, you know, you'll have to reconcile when you think about what you're replacing. So if you're replacing carbopenetrexid, you know, with or without IO, you know, we, we kind of find that to be a very efficacious and safe regimen. And so somebody who does well on TDXD, that's great. But if they develop ILD or other, you know, other toxicity, you know, you start to say, well, was that the great choice, the best choice? But I, I would still discuss that as a first line option, no question. So even so let's after talk. the... Go ahead, Luis. 
No, no, I was thinking that right. now we have phase three data with chemo plus, you know, uh, so maybe in that setting, you know, that would be uh, a place where, you know, that uh, I would think about. At least my label in my region is going to be quite strict at this stage, having a phase three so, so, uh, data on that setting. So I want to go through a, a few other uh, papers, uh, kind of moving away from targeted therapy. First, uh, just get your thoughts in terms of where we are in immunotherapy metastatic disease. But first, uh, Zosha Rubian in the chat room wants to know, what's the difference between a RET rearrangement, RET fusion, mutation, point mutation? Do RET inhibitors like sulpercatinib work on all of these? Uh, Really important question. So for RET, in lung cancer, you're really looking for the fusions or rearrangements. So, you know, common ones are CCD6 RET or KIF5B RET. These are the oncogenic drivers. And so you really, you know, there are other partners, but you're really looking for the fusion events. Occasionally we see RET mutations, which I would say on their own in the absence of a RET fusion are not something that we target. Um, the one caveat here is RET mutations can arise in the context of a RET fusion positive cancer treated with a selective RET inhibitor and can be, you know, resistance mutations. And that's important because in some cases we have some next generation RET inhibitor clinical trials that we might consider. But, you know, for a newly diagnosed patient, really, I only get excited about RET if it's a fusion um, event and not a point mutation. Really important point to clarify. So, so Luis, uh, we talked about uh, up from, um, uh, neoadjuvant IO. Now we're going to talk about metastatic disease. Uh, we saw some uh, data from the Empower Lung 1 and 3 trials looking at semiplumab, uh, both in terms of patient-reported functioning. But interestingly, uh, a paper looking specifically at semiplumab in these two studies, uh, so either semiplumab alone or with chemo, specifically in squamous cancer. I was mentioning our GYN symposium, semiplumab has great activity in uh, in cervical cancer and is uh, used a lot there and this was uh data presented in uh on the squamous in the squamous patients Luis, at this point uh when you think about uh, uh ios either as monotherapy with chemotherapy obviously we have three where we have data and uh, they're available first of all from your point of view can you distinguish the three well to be honest uh, if i'm using uh uh in high expressors, I tend to use a pembrolizumab uh, or a semiplumab. Those are the ones I've been using for quite some time. If I'm using chemo-IO, I think we have data now with uh, semiplumab. For some reason, I've been using pembrolizumab for ages. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, at least in squamous, I mean, it is clear, uh, a good option. Uh, 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 still, on the other hand, I don't see any clear reason to to change on the other hand. So I suppose that uh, I would understand uh, any choice. There are now some eight or nine agents with very similar results. And I, I wouldn't say uh, you choose any other that you run. It's just, you know, I tend to use the ones I've been using for ages, right? I don't know what you do, guys. And also, uh, I'm going to ask David, you know, this is something we ask a lot in a lot of our different meetings, which is uh, if you also agree that you can't really distinguish these agents, if one were priced significantly less than the other, would that uh, change the way you approach it? Yeah, I, Luis, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think I think the empowered data from one as monotherapy and three with chemo look very much um, – like the Pembro study, I mean, I, I think I think the uh, the data look pretty compelling, and I think semiplumab for me is very much uh, something I'd feel good in a in a blinded taste test to uh, to to be okay with, um, and so I, I'm not sure I agree the same with the Tizo uh, based on the data, and we we were part of that study, um, mm-hmm. uh, but I th- the ultimate question I think you're asking are there differences in these drugs. I mean, we haven't been able to compare them head to head. And so we have no data 
to say that Pembro or Simiplab are better or worse than each other. I just think we have some good, you know, four great randomized trials that show that they're better than chemo, um, they're better than chemo alone. So, actually, you so know, to be continued. So, Neil, at ESMO, there was another trial, the Perla trial. That was a phase two trial. That yeah, yeah, that's right, with Dostarlimab. Yeah, yeah, they compared chemo plus Pembro versus chemo plus Dostarlimab. The good thing about this trial is that they use the right comparator, right? They use chemo Pembro. So you don't have yeah. to do a cross trial comparisons. And that is something that maybe agencies should ask for any new agent, right? Yeah, Luis, that's a great point. Yeah. That a little bit under the radar. That's that's the only data set I'm aware of. Aware of. Yeah, I was uh, surprised when I saw that. What about uh, CTLA four IO Zosha? Of course, Ipi Nevo has been out there. We saw more data from the Poseidon trial at the uh, World Lung uh, meeting, looking at Dervalumab, Tremolimumab, a combination that actually we were talking about is the webinar on biliary cancer that's now approved first line in biliary. Any comments about uh, IO um, about IO or PD one plus uh, CTLA four? Zosha, one area I hear people talking about it was PD zero patients. Yeah, you know, I think this is still an area where we need to do a little bit of more work to really understand where, you know, wh wh which patients are most likely to benefit. I think we're, to be honest, still guessing a little bit um, at this point. You know, the the place where I have found this combination to be potentially useful in the clinic are one, you're, you're right, PDL1 negative patients, you know, where we worry that their benefit from, you know, a PD1 inhibitor alone won't be as much, but also patients with commutation. So SDK11 and KEEP1 commutation mutations where, again, we worry that their response to a PD-1 inhibitor, PDL one inhibitor alone won't be, um, won't be good enough. So, you know, especially younger patients where we really want to kind of throw everything that we can at those patients. I think a regimen like Poseidon, you know, with chemo plus PD-1 and CTLA-4, you could say the same about Checkmate 9LA also as another option. Um, you know, I, th I think that the co-mutation patients are, are the place where I've seen them you know, where I, I've tended to use this most, but um, I think we truthfully need better biomarkers to tell us which patients really need this combination because there is a little bit more toxicity with the four, right. with a CTLA-4 addition. David? Yeah, I mean, there, were, there was a suggestion, Zosha, too, that maybe squamous zeros, you know, would be the place, but I just haven't found that to be true. I have tried it a handful of times, and I just don't see that it, it's any better so than... Much better. Yeah, yeah. agree. All right. Well, let's talk about a little bit more about antibody drug conjugates. Actually, believe it or not, we did a similar program last week on breast cancer. I felt like that's all we were talking about there all of a sudden in breast cancer, too, as well. Of course, this was the, was the ESMO ADC, maybe, uh, in any event. And one uh, ADC that was presented in both breast cancer and lung cancer was uh, Datopotamab, a deruxtecan. Oops, went the wrong way. Uh, so, Luis, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts were about this uh, Phase three Tropion Lung 101 study that compared Dato DXD to Docetaxel and found uh, a benefit in terms of uh, the intention to treat population with a hazard rate of uh, 0.75 um, and uh, in terms of overall survival at this point not significant. And we'll talk about the uh, tolerability issues that were uh, discussed. But first, in terms of uh, the efficacy, Luis, what was your thoughts about it? And did this uh, uh, get you interested in potentially wanting to use this agent? So the interesting thing here was that uh, the benefit in terms of PFS was restricted to non-squamous tumors. Has a ratio being 0.66, and actually, patients uh, with squamous disease was even were doing worse as compared to Dothetaxel. Truly, we knew that a subset of patients with non-squamous are benefiting the most. Those are patients with genomic, asianable genomic aberrations, EFR mutations, ALCA translocations, and so on. In a different trial, we have seen the Tropion 905 responses in some 35% of the patients with genomic aberrations, and those data are actually consistent here. So the reason, so the question then is, what happened to those patients with adenocarcinomas, with non-squamous 
and non uh, and uh, wild type patients, let's say without genomic aberrations. Well, uh, the data suggests that uh, the hazard ratio is still in favor for those patients. Maybe the benefit is not as high. The second thing is what is going to happen when the data are mature enough for survival? At this stage, we haven't seen survival benefit, but uh, the data are still quite immature. And in terms of uh, 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 safety profile, I would say uh, we have seen uh, relevant toxicities such as ocular events and stomatitis. That is very important, in part because, you know, lung cancer doctor, we are not very used to those toxicities. So I'm pretty sure that we will learn to better treat and to better manage like this stomatitis and, uh, uh, and ocular toxicity. For example, when I give to my patients these uh, dexamethasone uh, rinses, they do have problems even at the local pharmacies to get the preparations done, you know. So anyway, I think we have to uh, uh, improve a bit on that, do some education to patients and to doctors. So, uh, David, I'm curious about your thoughts. You know, interestingly, we had Sarah Tulaney on our breast ESMO meeting last week, and she they really yeah. pioneered the use of um, uh, mouthwashes for mucositis from Everlimus. When they started doing the DATO trials, as soon as they started to see the mucositis, they pulled out the mouthwash, and she told me last week it works, but, you know, they have a lot of experience with that. So, David, what's your take on this? What's your thoughts about the histology uh difference there and about yeah. uh, how much of an issue these side effects are going to be? Um, I mean, I agree with Louise. I mean, I think it's it's a positive study for PFS. It's, it looks like the weight of that is carried by the non-squamous. You know, it's, you know, the, the overall survival is not there, but it's it wasn't intended to be at this point. And so is this good enough to replace docetaxel in a refractory patient population? And that, and at least adenocarcinoma, it looks like it met that it met that bar. Whether that's okay for the FDA or they're going to wait on OS to give give an approval here, I think we'll have to wait to see the side effects. I think you guys did a nice job describing. I mean, it's not without side effects. ILD is a real problem in in these patients, but fortunately, it's you know it's it is relatively low. The <laughs> the, the um, the steroid rinse, I yeah, that's new to me in terms of trying to figure out how to make that work. I've been using it for a while and and don't see the same the see it the same way that Sarah does. Uh, but it's probably because I'm just not as smart as her and, and figure out how to get patients to uh, get better on it. But you know, certainly try it. So yeah, and I have to find out what the secret uh, sauce is there, Zosha. Uh, what's your take on this? And also this issue, I mean, if the drug were available, would you uh, prefer or use it only in non-squamous? And any comments in terms of the uh, side effects profile? Yeah, I, I think overall I was somewhat underwhelmed by these data. I think it's always good to have more options. But, you know, having seen the press release saying this is a positive study, I think we were all hoping for more. Um, you know, I think that in the overall population, it sounds like we can all agree that a three-week essentially improvement in PFS is not clinically meaningful. So I think it really, you know, if we're going to use it, it's the the non-squamous patients. We have to keep in mind that that's a post-hoc, you know, subset analysis, but that does seem to be, you know, closer to a two-month improvement in PFS. So not a slam dunk, but some improvement. Um, so I think it's it's another option. Is it going to be an option that replaces docetaxel or is it going to be another option that we might use, you know, in sequence after docetaxel? I think that, you know, that probably both will, will be used. Uh, to me, the worry, you know, if this improved PFS by close to two months and was what better tolerated than docetaxel, that would be great. But I think the mucositis is a tough one. And, and you know, I think having to try to get patients to find these oral mouth, you know, steroid rinses. I've heard that um, e eating ice chips or sucking on ice chips during the infusions might help, you know, kind of things that, that can be a little bit tricky. I, I think that that's going to be a limitation. So again, always good to have options. I think I will use it. The question is going to be where in the sequence and where does the FDA approve it if, if it does approve it? 
And in terms of the ophthalmic issues, uh, David, I was telling Dr. Lisberg, you know, I feel like we talk about ophthalmic things every day, but we never have talked about it. We haven't talked about it much with you all, but almost everybody else, ADC, even other things besides ADCs. We did an entire CME program on just ophthalmic issues in oncology, but I have not seen any ophthalmic issues with agents for the drug delivery was DXD until this. It kind of sounds like similar to what we're hearing from Mervituximab, like a dry eye and yeah. seemingly like more of a nuisance than like a serious problem, you know, nuisance kind of problem. Is that your take, David? Yeah, it's, well, I mean, it, it's beyond a nuisance in some patients. I mean, it's, it could be kind of chronic dry, uh, red eyes, uh, looks like just a bad conjunctivitis. Um, I haven't really seen uh, visual acuity changes, but I've seen folks who just are constantly look like they have constant allergies and, you know, try all these eye drops. And it's not an easy thing to dismiss. Um, and uh, it is something you see across ADCs. Not all, but but it's common. You know, Neil, so, I think it's going to be very important that we have our uh, uh, ophthalmological clinics really open to our patients every day as we did with our dermatologists. So we now really a lot better in managing uh, skin side effects. So that is going to be important as well to those uh, uh, ophthalmic issues. And, uh, you know, today to me it's not easy to have an ophthalmologist seeing my patients on the very day I'm having a clinic. So that is going to be something that we have to uh, work out, really. They, Luis, even well, if they see them and send you a note, you can't understand what the note says. I mean, yeah, you, yeah, have to, yeah. uh, you have to. I agree. I agree. We have to learn about that. That is the full, the full issue. I mean, it's us, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, as we've been talking about, um, these novel agents tend to move up. And uh, we also saw some data at uh, the World Lung uh, Zosha bringing Dato up into the first line setting, the Tropion Lung 04 study, combining it with Dervalumab. I think we were mentioning that, you know, the idea of I, IO plus ADC is getting a lot of attention. First line therapy in bladder cancer nowadays. Any thoughts, uh, Zosha, about where this strategy might be heading? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think, of course, always a drug may have some activity in later lines. Many companies try to move to the first line, and I think we've seen this type of approach with a number of different ADCs kind of trying to create novel platinum doublets where one of the chemo partners is replaced by an ADC. You know, I think to me, a lot of, obviously, we'll have to see what it looks like, but the the toxicities in particular, I think, are, are going to be a, a concern that we're going to have to keep an eye on, again, particularly in first line therapy. For the non-squamous patients, I think carboplatin, pemetrexed, pembrolizumab overall is a fairly well-tolerated regimen. So I think we're going to have to really, you know, see how how these patients feel on these therapies. I'm frankly a little bit cautious about whether this is going to be a viable first-line strategy. But I'll reserve judgment until we see more data. You know, what we've seen so far has been extremely limited single-arm small cohorts. All right, well, let's finish out talking about small cell Again, you know, we've been looking for interesting, exciting things in small cell for the last couple of years, ever since the IOs came out. I'm starting to think that maybe we're getting close. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, there was some data presented at uh, ASCO from the Caspian study, uh, some patient-reported outcomes data um, that kind of was just kind of a reminder of this strategy that with a. a Dervalumab and atezolizumab plus uh, chemotherapy that came into the first line setting. Dr. Lisberg was pointing out that in, in these data that actually the three year survival was, a, you know, increased in, the, in these patients. And he was commenting in general, uh, David, <clears throat> on, you know, kind of what he's seen in his practice in terms of benefit of adding IO to chemo as first line therapy. And, you know, when the data first came out and we were looking at the data and comparing the two trials and then it sort of settled into practice, I always kind of wondered how much it really meant in terms of quality of life to these patients. It's hard to pull that out of trials, even a study like this, looking at patient-reported outcomes. What's been your observation in the pre-IO and post-IO era, David? Uh, does that give you a sense of encouragement that we're moving forward or maybe not really? Well, you know, look, I mean, we all use it, and I think we use 
Sterva or a Tizo at times. Um, I look, I don't think, I think it's been a modest, it's a, it's a real, but modest improvement. Um, I don't, I don't really, if you're asking about quality of life for patients who are on prolonged IO with small cell, you know, for the, for the few patients I have that are on prolonged IO therapy and small cell, I don't really see it to be any different than prolonged IO and non-small cell. Um, so I, you know, I think it, it was a major advance, certainly in the care of patients with first line disease, but I think we all feel that it was, uh, it was a small step and we've got to make more substantial steps for patients. So I want to talk about some of the new agents uh, that are starting to come out in small cell. Uh, Zosha, beginning with this one, IDXD, uh, and refractory uh, small cell, uh, an antibody drug conjugate uh, targeting B's, B7H3. Uh, any uh, comments? Looks like it uh, maybe has some activity. Yeah, I'll certainly um, let my co-panelists weigh in as well as if they have more experience. I personally have not used this drug. You know, I think that um, I, I would say that uh, taking a, a big step back, I think that where we see the most excitement right now is with kind of a, a slightly different approach with the bite therapies. And so, you know, I think that's probably this kind of flew a little bit maybe under the radar just because I think we are, you know, all quite excited about the bispecific um, T-cell engagers. But, you know, I, I think that these there's a number of these different approaches being tested. And, and so we'll have to really, you know, keep an eye on these to see. I, I think a key question with all of these therapies is going to be, are there biomarkers that, you know, tell us what's going on with these patients or is this an all-comers approach? But I'll let Dr. Pazarez, um, who sure. presented this data, comment on tarlatumab. You know, I, I think this is the really the standout for me in this group. And, and I also, I guess I'll very... point out, Luis, as far as I know, this is the first uh, CD3 bispecific uh, that's been reported to have positive results with a solid tumor. Does that sound right? Well, I think so. This is kind of the first uh, bite that is uh, shown to be active on solid tumors, particularly on a very poorly immunogenic tumors such as small cell lung cancer. We know for a number of years that those tumors do have downregulation of class one, so anti-gene presentation is not happening in many of those tumors. That is the reason why they are poorly immunogenic. So the good thing of the bite is uh, able to activate these cells on a non-canonical mechanism. And uh, the proof of that is being this trial showing that uh, 10 milligrams of talaramab is really showing responses in 40% of the patients, a bit better than 100 milligrams in this trial that was uh, part of the optimist strategy. And uh, the better thing was that um, PFS uh, uh, and OS seems to be pretty reasonable. Let's say 45% of the patient, uh, uh, sorry, 60% of the patient be still responding at six months. PFS being about 75% for those patients at six months in terms of survival. And uh, the other thing is that uh, safety profile is pretty reasonable. I could say 50% of the patients having CRS, typically grade one, and for most of the cases being only in cycle one and some patients in cycle two. But the more important thing is only one patient, 1%, having grade three uh, cytokine release syndrome. The same is to be true in, with ICANN. With 10 milligrams, we have seen only ICANNs in some patients in the first or second cycle and only grade one or two. Not a single patient had grade three. Still, you know, uh, even in ta- if you look at table, the toxicity is not very severe, but we have to admit that when your patient is having fever, that is grade one CRS, but you don't know what is going to happen two hours later. So you have to monitor the patient. You have to be sure that the patient is not getting into worse CRS because that maybe requires some urgent measurements, right? So the main issue is that we have to learn how to monitor those patients which patients should be in hospital, which patients can be treated from the beginning at home. And uh, this is something we will learn into the near future. But the more important thing is that it looks like we got a, a, a new strategy here. 
So, uh, David, the good news is I think the general medical oncologists are going to be ready for you because I was mentioning we're doing all these meetings at uh, ASH. Probably half the stuff we're going to talk about is between myeloma and lymphoma, bispecifics, the hottest thing in oncology. All general oncologists are, are, are learning about CRS, and they know it's coming to their clinic uh, soon. David, just curious, uh, if you could, would you want to use this drug based on what you're seeing on this slide, second line? Let me tell you, it's not just this drug. There's a number of DLL3 targeting drugs uh, in development, and absolutely, this is something I'm very excited about. And I think it's 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 if you were going to gamble, you would say this is going to be another major breakthrough in small cell. Early days, we need more data, but um, absolutely exciting. And and Neil, remember an older drug that in ADC yeah, that used to go by the name of Rovit was trying right. to target the same the same antigen. Um, this is just targeting CD3 at the same time. So, yeah, very exciting. I think uh, Luis nicely summarized uh, these data, which just were published in the New England Journal. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. And uh, Luis and Zosha and uh, David, thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Audience, thank you uh, for attending. Uh, come on back on Thursday night. Uh, we'll hear what Dr. Klempner has to say about TDXD and many other things in gastroesophageal cancers. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, faculty. Thanks, uh, Luis. Thanks, Osha. Thank Take you. care, Thank you. David. Thank you.